computer. Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and I'm here with Greg Althaus. Hi. He's a Rack and CTO um, and co-founder of the Digital Rebar Project. We are here to talk about something really super cool. It's Digital Rebar Provision. So we have carved out the provisioning service uh, from Digital Rebar as a standalone cobbler replacement. Uh, and so if you go to Digital Rebar, uh, this is early access. Um, right now it's under Digital Rebar Provision. We'll add links to the main project um, in May. Uh, and so basically from here you can go into our quick start guide and this is what we're going to show you how to do. Uh, if you want in the broader documentation, we have a ton of information about how this system works. Um, I'll take just a second to show you. We've got an architecture page that shows you the services, DHCP and Pixie provisioning, an API with authentication, lots of great stuff. Really taking uh, something as esoteric as Pixie provisioning to another level of capability. Uh, and we'll have videos describing all of this great stuff behind the scenes, template generation and the, the workflows and pieces like that. But you're watching this video to figure out how to install it on your desktop or on a, on a lab environment and get things going. So quick start is your thing. Uh, and Greg is here as my wingman to sort of walk through what's going on and describe uh, the process as we go. Um, and we'll have a couple of pauses where I'm going to pepper him with questions. For now, I've just created a subdirectory on my machine. This is a it's Golang, so we have Linux and um, Mac, if you're Windows, uh, Windows is a little bit more difficult, so Linux and Mac. I'm just going to take my curl bash script. Uh, Greg, if somebody doesn't trust curl bash, can they? Yeah, and then go to the, to the, directly to the link, look at the script, make sure they're happy with it, pull it locally, and then just run it locally with the parameters that you see on the end of the line there, and it should work the same way. So, it's going to go through, okay, it's making sure my tools are in. I need like 7-zip, I know, and something else. Yep. So to use this, you need two pieces, and it's already already done. It's already done. Woo! Um, but the first thing it needs is a BSD tar and 7-zip. We need those to explode ISOs to something that we can run with locally. And so those tools are needed, and, and the provisional will call out to those as needed. The rest of that is we pull the latest code that we've packaged up and um, made it available as a uh, zip with a checksum file out in GitHub. And the system, the install script downloads that, validates the checksum, then explodes the zip and it validates the checksums of the things in the zip so that everything's valid. So that's what that, those okays going by are. And then at the end, it pops out two lines that you need to actually run to Aha. run the actual provision. So what's happened is the system, ha the install script has looked at your network interfaces and decided that that's the one that the default route goes through. And that's what we're going to respond with so that you can have packets routed out to the right locations. Then it's also created a directory to serve files out of. And that's the TFTP boot. And it also created a directory to put and store objects in. So we're going to create objects for things like boot environments and templates and machines and leases and all sorts of stuff. But the, those two directories, and we've created them in a local space. And the idea is this install is just for a quick try it, play with it kind of environment. You can drop the isolated part of the, uh, on the on install script and it'll actually set it up in a more production-like environment where it'll put the, the system, the um, components, the CLI and the uh, server into... That's just isolated up here. Okay. Yeah. And so if you leave that off, then it'll actually install things like a uh, user local bin. It'll set up a um, services kind of script for system D or um, system five kind of style install um, service management and set that up so that you can then run the system commands to do service, you know, service restarts and starts and enable them so they can restart on reboots and stuff like that. It also create the directories instead of in this local space, more in var lib um, DR provision so that you can um, actually have persistent storage and all that kind of stuff. So I, I know that Pixie 
often requires DHCP. I see you're putting my static IP address in here. Is this going to then conflict with my, my DHCP server on my network? So by default, no. That's just what we're going to use as an outbound path if there's no other information. DR provision will attempt to figure out which interface on your box is appropriate for where the packet came in from and then use that IP on the way back out. This is just to make sure that we have something to fall back to if we can't see the the required path, right? So for example, if you have um, a DHCP relay in your network and this is the interface that those clients should be routable from, for example. Um, yeah, I just I just brought up the help because it, it occurs to me that you know obviously people are going to want to see there's a ton of options, right? And things like that that you would you would have. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and run this. Uh, and so I just I just ran it. So I'm sudo sudoing. I need I need admin permission to set up these services, mm -hmm. and then it's doing a whole bunch of stuff. What's what's going on? So then it's going to extract its assets, and then we're going to start up a TFTP server. It looks like you may already have one running. <laughs> looks like I do. Uh, so, all right, so let me figure out what's going on with that. Yep. So then it, it exits cleanly. Um, yeah, just control C there, yeah. So I so uh, P kill. So I, I'm going to remove like DN, uh, DNS mask is usually. Well, the, my oh. guess is no. For this one, 69 is your TFTP server. My guess is you probably oh. already have DR provision running somewhere on your system. I do. Look at that. It's right here. Uh, so let me see what's going on with that. Yep. All right. So previous tests run in astray there. So that's that's cool. I just killed that. Yep. So let so that's, let me be try again. Start. All right, so now what you'll see is we extracted assets. So if you look into the TFTP directory, you'll see we'll, we've populated it with some basic assets. So this, this directory over here? Yep. All right, let me go. So that here. becomes the um, file root that we're gonna serve from. And so we should see a whole Ooh. bunch of our base pixies. So at this point, we can boot various environments like Eufy, traditional bio, you know, legacy bio style, all those files are available and ready to go. At this point, there's no boot environments loaded, but you have the system up and running. So at this point you can go and look at UI or since there's one more step in what the install script kicked out, we should start that. And then while that's going on, we can do some of the other work. I had my I had my uh, pixie come in and do a sound check for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> nothing like an authentic video. <laughs> so then, if you scroll back up in your list, you'll see there's one other command that came out. So one of the things that we wanted to do with this quick start was when you run it isolated, we suggest a set of boot environments and templates to load, and we have a script that helps you do that. So it's okay. you do tools. So slash. scrolled way up in here. All right, here yeah, it is. So that one. So if you okay. run that command, what's going to happen is okay. it will download our discovery images. So by default, we don't ready load any good environment. Ready for me to do that? Yep. Let's get All that right. started. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Woo! So what you'll see is the system is figuring out what templates are already loaded and starts to install them. It's using the CLI to install a boot environment. The boot environment that is located in this directory in the assets directory. As a part of the process, we also need to install, and I have yet another bug. Uh, nothing like trying to help quickly. Um, it's all right. But we'll fi I'll fix that and it'll be a uh, correct here in a second. But the idea is that we need to download a ISO that represents our boot or discovery image, which we use the digital rebar sledgehammer tools. They work the same for both this environment as well as digital rebar core. So and this is this is related to some of this discovery image. Discovery workflow. So okay. we're giving you a way to discover machines on your network, right? So that's a really big deal. This isn't just a Pixie boot server. We actually have digital rebar workflows that do discovery images 
so that the first boot comes in, gets a generic image, and then comes back and then actually shows up in the infrastructure. Yes. Now, you don't have to run it that way, right? This is like you were saying, our basic discovery, but we also let you use the CLI to make reservations for machines so that they get specific IPs, so they don't have to just do open DHCP. You can also specify machines by MAC address and have them available so that they can then go through and be given install images without necessarily having to go through a discovery process. Right. We're trying to sh simplify and streamline for basic usage so that we can, so you can play with the product without necessarily having to know all of the ins and outs. And speaking of, that made me think to show the UI to people. Um, so there, there is a UI right now. We're still adding, we're extending the UI. The CLI and the API are pretty, are very complete because uh, that's what we, <laughs> we always use first. But there is an uh, UI on this to help people get, get moving. And I just brought it up. Okay, this UI is not very complete, right? There's just username, token. Yeah, so by default, we have uh, basic security models. So the system starts with a default user, rocket skate, and uh, colon. And the Oops. password is um, rocket skates, but with some slight tweaking to make it passwordish. So zero and 8s. So now you now you can see what is actually gets filled in. So at this point, the UI is loaded. You've given it a password. We also have a token system, so that you can create authorization tokens that provide limited scope and other things like that. We use them internally, but you can use it as a way to hand out to other users and control what they can do. Um, we'll talk about that more. Okay. Yeah. Later. So if I was going to use the DRP CLI right here, I could do it. I could get. A, I could generate a token. Mm -hmm. Say users help, and that would show me how to generate a token. So users token something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it'll show you all the parameters for what you need. The required one is ID, and then all the rest will you can override specifics like I only want this available or viable for 30 minutes or right or right. I only want this available f to work on machines API calls or things like that. Wow. So pretty fine-grained uh, capabilities here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right so if I if I pr if I run the CLI it's authenticated so I have to provide user and password mm -hmm. and then this would get me a token for uh, dropping into that UI uh, experience. And I know I could also take this token and I could run the UI with token equals token like that. And it would populate the token for me and do exactly the same thing. Yeah. Or I could do pass, I could do password instead of token for that too. Cool. All right. So, so at this point we yep. need to change one more thing, which you can change from here. The, the bug that we hit in the script didn't set all the preferences correctly. And uh, within okay. minutes, that will be a fix. But right now, you can see we have two sets of preferences we actually want to set. One is um, the unknown boot environment. So by default, just in case we actually were to get that an address, the first thing we do is we tell the systems to boot from their local disks. That's the ignore boot environment. So, so boot environments are telling the system what basically to hand out when, when people boot? That's right. The, okay. And so there's two types of boot environments. One, ones are used for when we don't know anything about the machine. So if a machine just shows up and we're told some through either DHCP or to give that machine information, we use the unknown boot environment. So right now it's set to ignore, which means this local disk, right? Okay. Now, if you change that to discovery, what will happen instead is that the system will hand out a RAM only image that will boot, discover, and add the node as a machine into Digital Rebar provision. Now the other one is the default boot environment, and that's what machines get created with. So if a machine gets created without a boot environment, 
the default boot environment is given. In this case, it's Sledgehammer, which is the same as Discovery. It's just for a specific individual machine. It's so just I, this this trip used to trip me up a bit. Unknown is when a system hasn't doesn't have any entries. So it's it's unknown to the system. Um, we'll talk about subnets in a second. Default is when it's already known, but we haven't set anything for it. Correct. Okay. Makes sense. This is if if you're not used to the esoterics of how DHCP and reservations work and things like that, then th this is this is more obvious when you think of a DHCP server handing out addresses and reservations and creating entries. Um, and there's sort of two modes for for that behavior and provision does that just because that's it's implementing those services. So this is cool. I'm ready to boot a machine. Am I done? That's right. Yeah. Uh, no. And one more oh. thing. So okay. ideally the install process, you run those two commands that it kicked out and it has downloaded all your boot environments, set your preferences, the whole preferences thing we went through, you shouldn't have to do. You should be able to validate that it looks like this after running the scripts. But the one thing we can't do for you is guess your networks. So you mm -hmm. have to create a subnet at this point. So what we've done to help you. Ah, right, so this is empty right here. This is the right, top. top part. So what we've done is provided you a look at your local machines interfaces. So in this case, it looks like on your system, there's a machine for your local interface, right? Your, okay. That's what you're running. That's your machine's ah, IP. This is my machine IP address, right? Right, and then it looks like you have a Docker system running that's got a couple IPs on it. We don't know which one you want us to serve from, so we provided both as a thing, as an option. And then it looks like you also have a KVM interface um, for like using your Versh kind of shell or okay. virtual box or we'll show up. Some I've, I've actually got a virtual machine manager ready to go, so you're safe. Yeah. So at this point, you can select one of those and it'll give you a pre-populated set of fields to kind of work from. Okay. And so in this case, it's going to create a subnet named after your interface, just kind of That's help convenient. you track it. It'll create the subnet based upon um, what it sees as the interface. While that's not exactly a true subnet interface, it's fine. You could change that to zero if you wanted to. We already do the masking off when we actually apply it. So it, it doesn't really matter. The idea is you can do reservations, whether we allow for optional reservations or required reservations. Basically, that's do we have to know about a machine before we give out the address. If it's uh, optional, then that means that we'll give out addresses to things from the ranges as we see them. If it says required, then you actually have to go into the API and use the reservations API to give a machine a specific IP to Mac kind of mapping. So that way you can handle the cases where I can't run an open DHCP server. But in this case, uh, we're going to start okay. from that path. Then we specify the lease times. The idea is that for optional leases, we have a shorter lease time so that it can cycle and we can recover those addresses faster. Reserved addresses have a longer lease time because you've dedicated them to them so you can set it up longer. So right now we set it to a minute. Uh, okay. This is probably so this a little low, bounce, but. Bounce machines through a rack with a small range. Is right. Yeah. And if you're just gonna provision them and then have us be done and not use it anymore. Right, so and, this, is, this is digital rebar's behavior. Uh, digital rebar proper bounces things through a, a DHCP um, right. ad hoc really quickly and then goes to permanent addresses. Okay. Right. And this, this allows is. the specification of both. And then you create a range. So you need to specify a range. In this case, the UI just defaulted to 10 addresses in the space, but you could alter that. You can make it bigger, smaller. In Ooh, this okay. regard, you need to make sure you, yeah, make sure you have enough addresses. Then it's going to populate some base fields for you. So the next server is the address of this node so that it knows who to ask for uh, provisioning. This is where that static IP comes in. If, for example, the subnet wasn't a local one, then you would use that address. This would also be what, if I wasn't gonna hand out DHCP addresses at all, this would let me um, gener move, push things into Pixie correctly, right? That's the- Correct, so you could modify your existing DHCP server to say the next server is this system. Um, but anyway, we then have a set of base options that you need to fill in. Uh, the system is going to give you some examples. The main one that you you can fill in with the appropriate gateway and DNS servers if you want. In our case, we're just going to use the, the main admin node itself. And you do have to give a domain name. It can be fake. It doesn't have to be real. 
um, it's just going to be the basis for the name that your machines are. If, if digital rebar provision has to provide a name to the system, it will use this domain name to fill out a fully qualified domain. Okay. An option, what, what the, what's so the option scores here? No, those are the DHCP <laughs> server options. So DHCP defines a set of options in its header. So in this case, DHCP option three is known as the gateway option. Option 15 is the domain, uh, name, right? So there's some RFC somewhere I could read. Yeah, there's really an RFC that, that defines those, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm the other the, yeah. Well, the important other one is the boot file. And that represents the image that's going to be started. We're just going to default with this. So this will work for Linux, uh, legacy BIOS. If you have to do something else, there's other commands that we can talk to you about. And we'll document what you put in there. Right. So um, this, is, this is basically my training reel, wheels entry. Yeah. There's a more complex one that allows you to support both UFI and legacy BIOS and another, another one, all from the same image. And it lets you make choices based upon the packet. And, all sorts of complex stuff, but we'll document it. Logic, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. And then you add it. And at this Whoop. point, you you should be able to now. Oh, it. look. And it, it told me it did stuff over here, yeah. too. Okay. Yeah. So I'm watching the scroll. Cool. Yeah. So at this point, you should be able to boot a machine, and it should go through this discovery process. So I've, I've got one set up. I'm going to go ahead and boot that one, and then I'll add one so that people can... Uh, see exactly what I did. Yep. So down, down here, there's a couple things going on. It's really, really fun. So down here, I can actually watch it doing work. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the machine boot here and I'm watching provision actually hand out addresses and talk to the system and things like that. This is super quick. Um, did, did we manage to get the, the digital rebar two-stage bootloader to work for provision? Uh -huh. that part of this? Yeah, so like I said, it uses the digital rebar's sledgehammer image, and we alter it to change the template slightly to get a different um, end state so that instead of registering with digital rebar, it registers with digital rebar provision. And so... What happens is we pixie boot, we use TFTP to send a very small image over. And then for performance and scale reasons, we then have that immediately switch and pull over a bigger image through HTTP. TFTP is kind of um, not very efficient. And so if you have a lot of things booting, it can actually cause problems on your network and on your server. So what we do is we send a small image over, a couple TFTP requests that are very small, then it switches to HTTP, sends a sends over a slightly bigger image, much quicker, and then boots into this RAM only image. And all that does is basically make sure you can talk to the network. We inject one of these tokens that's specialized. It's per instance of the machines. So for a very small window, in fact, for six minutes, that token is valid and then we'll go away. So, um, which is specified, or 10 minutes, which is specified in those timeouts. So. The uh, anyway, it created a machine. We use the MAC address of the booting interface as the base for the name. Apply the DNS uh, domain that you provided. There's the address that it was handed out, and okay. then what environment it's currently running. So at this point, you have a machine, and it's been. So I, I could see this from here too. DRP client, and I could do a machines list. Mm -hmm. I just say control L so I would clear the background machines list. Machines list. <laughs> Got to type right. It'll tell you. So there's our machine. Right. So if I wanted to boot, all right, so there's, so I want to show people how to, what I did to create this. Um, you could do the same thing with, with uh, um, virtual box or something like that. I'm going to create a new machine in my virtual machine manager. Um, with a network boot. Actually, can we yep. do something first real quick? Or yeah, that right there. So I don't know if you wanted to show install running too, but I would love why, it. Why don't we get that going first? So okay. the next thing to yeah. do is to CD into assets real quick. So at this point we have, um, we have the system set up to do discovery, but a lot of times you want to actually install a machine as well. So 
what we want to do is if you do an LS on bootims, you'll see that we provide a bunch of templates or Ooh, a, lot of templates. a lot of basic boot environments to provide. And so these represent images you could install. So at this point, one of the things so this we, is, this is inheriting from the digital rebar library. Yeah, but slightly modified to work, work better with provision. So if you, do an LS. So one of the things, right, digital rebar allows you to inject a whole bunch of parameters into boot environments. And so does provision. But digital rebar assumes that that's going to be there and that's the end state. In provision, we didn't want to make you have to inject asset, you know, parameters and stuff for actions. You can, but you don't have to. So these, these templates have been modified to make them optional. So if you go here, you can do... Uh, Dot dot yeah DRP CLI. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna be lazy because I don't want to have to type the password again. <laughs> yeah yeah right. no, that's cool. Change machines to boot ems. Boot EMVS okay. And install okay. And then if you go to the end, either way, uh, Control L because we're gonna do that. Uh, no no boot ems no just do boot ems. Oh. Boot ems and then let's do Ubuntu. U16, yeah, if you do that, what's going to happen is it's going to add all the templates and then it's going to help you by going out and getting the current ISO for that image, downloading it locally and then uploading it into the system. Now, while this is going, it's going to pull it all down. It's also going to cache it locally. So it's already downloaded it to the local directory. So we're building up a directory here too. And then it's now uploading it. Not having gigabit fiber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then it's done, right? So at this point, um, if you do an ls in this directory, okay, we've created an ISOs directory, and in that ISOs directory, we're caching all these files. So if you ever needed to like start over, wipe over, if you left this ISOs directory here with these assets, you wouldn't have to re-download them; it just upload it directly into provision. Oh, that's that really way. handy. So that way you can okay. pre-populate it if you know you have them or you need to pull them from a place you locally have them. Um, it's also the case that all of the stuff we showed you requires internet. You can actually, if you have to do this behind a firewall or other things, you can pull that uh, zip file and the SHA sum file and the ISOs and put them in these places and run it without ever having to go out to the internet. Okay? That's really cool. All right. So now if you go look in the UI and refresh the screen here, you'll see that we now have a new boot environment. Look at that. Okay. And it's available. The available means yes. And so you can see we've got templates. The templates represent booting, pre-seed, post-seed actions, all the things you need to do and install. So one of the things you can do is, now if you go to the machine section, and all this you can okay. drop to the CLI, change the boot environment to a bunch Ooh, look, it's there now. Install. Right. Now if you update that, Okay. Right. So now if you update that and then reboot this node. Okay. What should happen is we will go through, we'll repixie, and instead of getting the sledgehammer image, we should get the basic install image for um, Ubuntu. Wow, all right. So I'm showing a whole bunch of stuff on the screen. Mm -hmm. In this case, we see it's now starting the install process. So I'm while this runs, yeah. yeah, so this is your traditional Ubuntu installer, right? So now it's going to go off and install Ubuntu 16.4. So now, while this is running, why don't you show them how you created this virtual machine? Cool. Okay. So what I, what I did was I created a new virtual machine. I picked uh, Network Boot, although I could, I could tweak it through other stuff, but Network Boot, I picked a Linux system. Uh, let's see. I didn't give it much RAM or CPUs because I'm really practicing booting here. I let it build a new disk. So pretty much just walking through the normal stuff. Call it 1604. Uh, and I had to pick a network for it to attach to. So in this case, I didn't just pick NAT. Um, I wanted to share my device. And so my bridge name here, I'm jumping back to my UI came from right here, okay? So I did that and I finished. Woo it's creating the machine. 
Uh, whoop, it's trying to boot it already. That was quick. Um, and it looks like it's actually going to go and go do it. So I was going to uh, do some settings on this, but I didn't need to do any. That was it. It's going. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited because the first time I did this, I had to tweak it a little bit, make sure it net booted. Um, wow. So it looked like the install actually had an issue. And my guess is that we need to specify more specifically about what um, disk we need, what the disk needs to look like. Ah, uh, okay. But now, so Sledgehammer is an in-memory boot, so I'm I'm not that that's pretty straightforward. Right. That, but here's my second machine. It got into predictable address. All looks good. So this UX is not surfacing the. Uh, let me show you the swagger pieces, because you know if you're if you're actually trying to make this stuff go. Um, Let's see, it actually needs to not be on 127. It needs to be on 192, which is still my machine, 1.233. So uh, if you're, especially if you're using this remote, um, the Swagger JSON file has to be retrievable. This is just Swagger's UI. It's their, their standalone. This is the old one. They have a new one we need to adapt to that's in React. Um, this is it. This is all the UI fields that are exposed. Same thing as what the CLI shows. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see the, the addresses that got handed out. Um, I could look at all sorts of stuff. Wow. All right. Tons of information about how to use the API. Mm -hmm. And you can actually out. drive it from here too. So if you click on the little, that thing. This thing. Yep. And this is where you could put a token in the bottom okay. or you could fill in with the rockets. You could way. be lazy. Hold on. Here's my token. Token. Authorize. Okay, so now you can go and try it out and see that uh, we got uh, 401. Oh. It means that I've messed up the, the tokens. Yeah, you need to you need to go back and in here for the token you actually have to you have to put log out. And this is the interesting swagger doesn't actually define bearer tokens. So you have to type bearer. Space and now a token. token. <laughs> right. Now you should be able to say try it. Yay. There you go. <laughs> and there's always our nice to actually encounter something like that in the video so people people know what to do. Uh, boy, that's cool. So these are my leases. Mm -hmm. So this is an API driven DHCP server, multiple, multiple interfaces. It can be, it can, it can be the, the um, responding DHCP or it can be um, just a, a forwarded DHCP. Um, yeah. The target of a forwarder. Yeah. And with security. So you have a DHCP that you can drive programmatically with security. That's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. API security. API security. Um, even handing out short-term use tokens if somebody needs to do some, you know, if you wanted to let somebody access DHCP for a little while. Um, yep. Yeah, that's, that's pretty darn cool. Wow, there's a lot of stuff. So, so the UX really hasn't exposed even a, a fraction of what is really behind the scenes to make all these pieces and parts work. That sounds like a longer video to explain mm -hmm. how everything here fits together. Um, I know there's, I know that it's a surprisingly complex task. Um, I guess the workflows sort of show this to bounce back and forth between DHCP and TFTP and HTTP and uh, make all this stuff work. What about like out of band management? If I want to programmatically reboot. Yeah. So right now, well, it's not the goal of digital rebar provision to do that. It's job is just to provide an environment to install and discover machines. If you want out of band management, that's where digital rebar comes in. It's got better features to manage the IPMI addresses and other things like that. So if that's what you're looking for, then you want to look for digital rebar right now. Um, as we go forward, digital rebar provision will interact better with digital rebar and will be able to handle that kind of full life cycle. But right now the intent was just to get something that you could 
throw an OS on something and then be done. Makes sense. So cobbler replacement, basically. Yep. You can get things going. And then when people need that next step up, uh, Rebar kicks in with all of the workflows and out of band management and written BIOS configuration and event driven stuff. Wow, there's a lot more, not more, a lot more when you get into the full rebar suite. Cool. Wow. This was um, a big tour with a lot of stuff. And just on the quick start, there's still uh, videos we need to do for dev environments. Those will come in a little while. Um, and more production installs and capabilities. What, what I would ask is, you know, look at this video. We're probably going to do some shorter versions of it also just to help people walk right through. This was meant to be a, really a tour of that out-of-the-box experience. Ask us questions. Um, we're we are, uh, involved and, and engaged in the community. Um, there's an active Gitter, Gitter room and IRC, and it's all hooked together. So if you talk to us on Slack, IRC, or Gitter, we, we, everybody sees it. So um, pretty straightforward from that perspective. Um, this is early access still. Uh, May 4th, we will actually be sort of opening up the floodgates and talking about this more broadly. But that doesn't mean you should keep it quiet. Um, please work with us. Talk, you know, ask us questions. We want to make sure that this is working. Um, as we get towards that, that bigger um, announce about digital rebar is, is something, uh, digital rebar provision is something we think is a, a bigger deal. So, hey, Greg, thank you for taking the time to walk us through a lot of these details. There's, there was a lot of great information, so I appreciate that. No, cool. Hopefully it's get out there and get useful.